You get more heat from the sun than from the old radiators at home. Yeah, them old white landlords sure don't give much heat, and they always knocking at your door for money. I'll be glad when summer comes. Me too, Bigger said. He stretched his arms above his head and yawned, his eyes moistened. The sharp precision of the world of steel and stone dissolved into blurred waves. He blinked and the world grew hard again, mechanical, distinct. A weaving motion in the sky made him turn his eyes upward. He saw a slender streak of billowing white blooming up against the deep blue. A plane was riding high up in the air. Look, Beggar said. What? That plane riding up there, Bigger said, pointing. Oh. They squinted at a tiny ribbon of unfolding vapor that spelled out the word use. The plane was so far away that at times the strong glare of the sun blinked it from sight. You can hardly see it, Gus said. Looks like a little bird, Bigger breathed with childlike wonder. Them white boys sure can fly, Gus said. Yeah, Bigger said wistfully. They get a chance to do everything. Noiselessly, the tiny plane looped and veered, vanishing and appearing, leaving behind it a long trail of white plumage, like coils of fluffy paste being squeezed from a tube. A plume coil that grew and swelled and slowly began to fade into the air at the edges. The plane wrote another word, speed. How high you reckon he is, Bigger asked. I don't know, maybe a hundred miles, maybe a thousand. I could fly one of them things if I had a chance, Bigger mumbled reflectively, as though talking to himself. Gus pulled down the corners of his lips, stepped out from the wall, squared his shoulders, doffed his cap, bowed low, and spoke with mock deference. Yes, sir. You go to hell, Bigger said, smiling. Yes, sir, Gus said again. I could fly a plane if I had a chance, Bigger said. If you wasn't black, and if you had some money, and if they'd let you go to the aviation school, you could fly a plane, Gus said. For a moment, Bigger contemplated all the ifs that Gus had mentioned. Then both boys broke into hard laughter, looking at each other through squinted eyes. When their laughter subsided, Bigger said in a voice that was half question and half statement, It's funny how the white folks treat us, ain't it? It better be funny, Gus said. Maybe they're they right in not wanting us to fly, Bigger said, because if I took a plane up, I'd take a couple of bombs along and drop them sure as hell. They laughed again, still looking upward. The plane sailed and dipped and spread another word against the sky. Gasoline. You speed gasoline, Bigger mused, rolling the word slowly from his lips. God, I'd like to fly up there in that sky. God'll let you fly when he gives you your wings up in heaven, Gus said. They laughed again, reclining against the wall, smoking, the lids of their eyes drooped softly against the sun. Cars was passed on rubber tires. Bigger's face was metallically black in the strong sunlight. There was in his eyes a pensive, brooding amusement, as of a man who had been long confronted and tantalized by a riddle whose answer seemed always just on the verge of escaping him, but prodding him irresistibly on to seek its solution. The silence irked Bigger. He was anxious to do something to evade looking so squarely at this problem. Let's play white, Bigger said, referring to a game of playing acting in which he and his friends imitated the ways and manners of white folks. I don't feel like it, Gus said. General, Bigger pronounced in a sonorous tone, looking at Gus expectantly. Aw, oh, hell, I don't want to play, Gus whined. You'll be court-martialed, Bigger said, snapping out of his words with military precision. You nuts, Gus laughed. General, Bigger tried again, determinedly. Gus looked wearily at Bigger, then straightened, saluted, and answered. Yes, sir. Send your, your men over the river at dawn and attack the enemy's left flank, Bigger ordered. Yes, sir. Send the 5th, 6th, and 7th regiments, Bigger said, frowning, and attack with tanks, gas planes, and infantry. Yes, sir, Gus said, saluting and clicking his heels. For a moment they were silent, facing each other, their shoulders thrown back, their lips compressed to hold down the mounting impulse to laugh. Then they guffawed, partly at themselves and partly at the vast white world that sprawled and towered in the sun before them. Say, what's the left flank, Gus asked. I don't know, Bigger said. I heard it in the movies. They laughed again. After a bit, they relaxed and leaned against the wall, smoking. Bigger saw Gus cup his left hand to his ear as though holding a telephone receiver and cup his right hand to his mouth as though talking into a transmitter. Hello, Gus said. Hello, Bigger said. Who's this? This is Mr. J.P. Morgan speaking, Gus said. Yes, sir, Mr. Morgan, Bigger said, his eyes filled with mock adulation and respect. I want you to sell 20,000 shares of U.S. Steel in the market this morning, Gus said. At what price, sir? Bigger asked. Ah, uh, just dumping at any price, Gus said with casual irritation. We're holding too much. Yes, sir, Bigger said. And call me at the club at two this afternoon and tell me if the president telephoned, Gus said. Yes, sir, Mr. Morgan, Bigger said. Both of them made gestures signifying that they were hanging up telephone receivers. Then they bent double, laughing. 
I bet that's just the way they talk, Gus said. I wouldn't be surprised, Bigger said. They were silent again. Presently, Bigger cupped his hand to his mouth and spoke through an imaginary telephone transmitter. Hello? Hello, Gus answered. Who's this? This is the President of the United States speaking, Bigger said. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. President, Gus said. I'm calling a cabinet meeting this afternoon at four o'clock and you, as Secretary of State, must be there. Well now, Mr. President, Gus said, I'm pretty busy. They raise in sand over here in Germany and I gotta send him a note. But this is important, Bigger said. What are you going to take up at this cabinet meeting? Gus asked. Well, you see, people are raising sand all over the country, Bigger said, struggling to keep back his laughter. We've got to do something about these black folks. Oh, if it's about the blacks, I'll be right there, Mr. President, Gus said. They hung up imaginary receivers and leaned against the wall and laughed. A streetcar rattled by. Bigger sighed and sore. God damn it. What's the matter? They don't let us do nothing. Who? The white folks. You talk like you just now finding that out, Gus said. No, nah, but I just can't get used to it, Bigger said. I swear to God I can't. I know I oughtn't think about it, but I can't help it. Every time I think about it, I feel like somebody's poking a red hot iron down my throat. God damn it, look. We live here and they live there. We black and they white. They've got things and we ain't. They do things and we can't. It's just like living in jail. Half the time I feel like I'm on the outside of the world peeping in through a knot hole in the fence. Ah, uh, ain't no use feeling that way about it. It don't help none, Gus said. You know one thing, Bigger said? What? Sometimes I feel like something awful is going to happen to me. Bigger spoke with a tinge of bitter pride in his voice. What you mean, Gus asked, looking at him quickly. There was fear in Gus's eyes. I don't know. I just feel that way. Every time I get to thinking about me being black and they being white, me being here and they being there, I feel like something awful is going to happen to me. Aw, oh, for Christ's sake, there ain't nothing you can do about it. How come you want to worry yourself? You black and they make the laws. Why they make us live in one corner of the city? Why don't they let us fly planes and run big ships? Gus hunched bigger with his elbow and mumbled good-naturedly. Aw, oh, quit thinking about it. You'll go nuts. The plane was gone from the sky and the white plumes of floating smoke were thinly spread, vanishing. Because he was restless and had time on his hands, Bigger yawned again and hoisted his arms high above his head. Nothing ever happens, he complained. What you want to happen? Anything, Bigger said with a wide sweep of his dingy palm, a sweep that included all the possible activities of the world. Then their eyes were riveted. A slate-colored pigeon swooped down to the middle of the street, steel car tracks, and began strutting to and fro with ruffled feathers, its fat neck bobbing with regal pride. A streetcar rumbled forward and the pigeon rose swiftly through the air on wings stretched so taut and sheer the bigger could see the gold of the sun through their translucent tips. He tilted his head and watched the slate-colored bird flap and wheel out of sight over the edge of the high roof. Now, if only I could do that, bigger said. Gus laughed. You nuts. I reckon we the only things in the city that can't go where we want to go and do what we want to do. Don't think about it, Gus said. I can't help it. That's why you're feeling like something awful is going to happen to you, Gus said. You think too much. What in hell can a man do, Bigger asked, turning to Gus. Get drunk and sleep it off. I can't. I'm broke. Bigger crushed a cigarette and took out another one and offered the package to Gus. They continued smoking. A huge truck swept past, lifting scraps of white paper in the sunshine. The bits settled down slowly. Gus, huh? You know where the white folks live? Yeah, Gus said, pointing eastward over across the line, over there on Cottage Grove Avenue. No, nah, they don't, Bigger said. What you mean, Gus asked, puzzled. Then where do they live? Bigger doubled his fist and struck his solar plexus. Right down here in my stomach, he said. Gus looked at Bigger searchingly, then away, as though ashamed. Yeah, I know what you mean, he whispered. Every time I think of it, I feel him, Bigger said. Yeah, and in your chest and throat too, Gus said. It's like fire, and sometimes you can't hardly breathe. Bigger's eyes were wide and placid, gazing into space. That's when I feel like something awful is going to happen to me. Bigger paused, narrowed his eyes. Nah, it ain't like something going to happen to me. It's, it's like I was going to do something I can't help. Yeah, Gus said with uneasy eagerness. His eyes were full of a look compounded of fear and admiration for Bigger. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's like you're going to fall and don't know where you're going to land. Gus's voice trailed off. The sun slid behind a big white cloud, and the street was plunged in cool shadow. Quickly, the sun edged forth again, and it was bright and warm once more. A long, sleek black car, its fenders glinting like glass in the sun, shot past them at a high speed and turned a corner a few blocks away. 
Bigger pursed his lips and sang, Zoom. They got everything, Bigger said. They own the world, Bigger said. Ah, oh, what the hell, Gus said. Let's go into the pool room. Okay. They walked toward the door of the pool room. Say, you taking that job you told us about, Gus asked. I don't know. You talk like you don't want the job. Oh, hell yes, I want the job, Bigger said. They looked at each other and laughed. They went inside. The pool room was empty, save for a fat black man who held a half-smoked, unlit cigar in his mouth and leaned on the front counter. To the rear burned a single green-shaded bulb. Hi, Doc, Bigger said. You boys kind of early this morning, Doc said. Jack or GH around yet, Bigger asked. Nah, Doc said. Let's shoot a game, Gus said. I'm broke, Bigger said. I got some money. Switch on the light. The balls are racked, Doc said. Bigger turned on the light. They lagged for first shot. Bigger won. They started playing. Bigger's shots were poor. He was thinking of Lums, fascinated with the idea of the robbery, and a little afraid of it. Remember what we talked about so much? Bigger asked in a flat, neutral tone. Nah. Old Blum? Oh, Gus said. We ain't talked about that for a month. How come you think of it all of a sudden? Let's clean this place out. I don't know. It was your plan from the start, Bigger said. Gus straightened and stared at Bigger, then at Doc, who was looking out the front window. You gonna tell Doc? Can't you never learn to talk low? Oh, I was just asking you. Do you want to try it? Nah. How come? You scared because he's a white man? Nah, but Blum keeps a gun. Suppose he beats us to it. Ah, oh, you scared, that's all. He's a white man and you scared. The hell I'm scared, Gus. Hurt and stung, defended himself. Bigger went to Gus and placed an arm about his shoulders. Listen, you won't have to go in. You just stand at the door and keep watch, see? Me and Jack and GH will go in. If anybody comes along, you whistle and we'll go out the back. That's all. The front door opened. They stopped talking and turned their heads. Here comes Jack and GH now, Bigger said. Jack and GH walked to the rear of the pool room. What are you guys doing, Jack asked. Shooting a game. Want to play, Bigger asked. You asking him to play and I'm paying for the game, Gus said. They all laughed and Bigger laughed with them but stopped quickly. He felt that the joke was on him and he took a seat along the wall and propped his feet up on the rungs of the chair as though he had not heard. Gus and GH kept on laughing. You is crazy, Bigger said. You laugh like monkeys, and you ain't got nerve enough to do nothing but talk. What do you mean, G.H. asked. I got a haul all figured out, Bigger said. What haul? Old Blums. There was silence. Jack lit a cigarette. Gus looked away, avoiding the conversation. If Old Blum was a black man, you all would be itching to go. Because he's white, everybody's scared. I ain't scared, Jack said. I'm with you. You say you got it all figured out, G.H. asked. Bigger took a deep breath and looked from face to face. It seemed to him that he should not have to explain. Look, it'll be easy. There ain't nothing to be scared of. Between three and four ain't nobody in the store but the old man. The cop is way down at the other end of the block. One of us will stay outside and watch. Three of us will go in, see? One of us will throw a gun on old Blum. One of us will make for the cash box under the counter. One of us will make for the back door and have it open so we can make a quick getaway down the back alley. That's all. It won't take three minutes. I thought we said we wasn't never going to use a gun, G.H. said, and we ain't bothered no white folks before. Can't you see? This is something big, Bigger said. He waited for more objections. When none were forthcoming, he talked again. We can do it if you ain't scared. Save for the sound of Doc's whistling up front, there was silence. Bigger watched Jack closely. He knew that the situation was one in which Jack's word would be decisive. Bigger was afraid of Gus because he knew that Gus would hold out if Jack said yes. Gus stood at the table, toying with the cue stick, his eyes straying lazily over the billboard balls scattered about the table and the array of the unfinished game. Bigger rose and sent the balls whirling with a sweep of his hand, then looked straight at Gus at the gleaming balls, kissed and rebounded from the rubber cushions, zigzagging across the table's green cloth. Even though Bigger had asked Gus to be with him in the robbery, the fear that Gus would really go made the muscle of Bigger's stomach tighten. He was hot all over. He felt as if he wanted to sneeze and could not only it was more nervous than wanting to sneeze. He grew hotter, tighter. His nerves were taut and his teeth were on edge. He felt that somebody would soon snap within him. God damn it, say something, somebody. I'm in, Jack said again. I'll go if the rest goes, G.H. said. Gus stood without speaking and Bigger felt a curious sensation, half sensual, half thoughtful. He was divided and pulled against himself. He had handled things just right so far. All but Gus had consented. The way things stood now, there were three against Gus, and that was just as he had wanted it to be. Bigger was afraid of robbing a white man, and he knew that Gus was afraid too. Blum's store was small, and Blum was alone, but Bigger could not think of robbing him without being flanked by his three pails. 
but even with his pails, he was afraid. He had argued all of his pails but one into consenting into the robbery, and toward the lone man who held out, he felt a hot hate and fear. He had transferred his fear of the whites to Gus. He hated Gus because he knew that Gus was afraid, as even he was, and he feared Gus because he felt that Gus would consent, and then he would be compelled to go through with the robbery. Like a man about to shoot himself and dreading to shoot and yet knowing that he was to shoot and feeling it all at once and powerfully, he watched Gus and waited for him to say yes. But Gus did not speak. Bigger's teeth clamped so tight that his jaws ached. He edged toward Gus, not looking at Gus, but feeling the presence of Gus all over his body, through him, in and out of him, and hating himself and Gus because he felt it. Then he could not stand it any longer. The hysterical tensity of his nerves urged him to speak, to free himself. He faced Gus, his eyes red with anger and fear, his fists clenched and held stiffly to his side. You black son of a bitch, he said in a voice that did not vary in tone. You scared because he's a white man. Don't cuss me, Bigger, Gus said quietly. I am cussing you. You don't have to cuss me, Gus said. Then why don't you use that black tongue of yours, Bigger asked. Why don't you say what you're going to do? I don't want to have to use my tongue unless I want. I don't have to use my tongue unless I want to. You bastard, you scared bastard. You ain't my boss, Gus said. You yellow, Bigger said. You scared to rob a white man. Ah, Bigger, don't say that, G.H. said. Leave him alone. He's yellow, Bigger said. He won't go with us. I didn't say I wouldn't go, Gus said. Then for Christ's sake, what are you going to do, Bigger said. Gus leaned on his cue stick and gazed at Bigger, and Bigger's stomach tightened as though he were expecting a blow and were getting ready for it. His fist clenched harder. In a split second, he felt how his fist and arm and body would feel if he hit Gus squarely in the mouth, drawing blood. Gus would fall, and he would walk out of the whole thing would be over, and the robbery would not take place. And his thinking and feeling in this way made the choking tightness rising from the pit of his stomach to his throat slacken a little. You see, Bigger, began Gus in a tone that was a compromise between kindness and pride. You see, Bigger, you're the cause of all the trouble we ever have. It's your hot temper. Now, how come you want me to cuss me? Ain't I got a right to make up my mind? Nah, that ain't your way. You start cussing. You say I'm scared. It's you who's scared. You scared I'm going to say yes, and then you'll have to go through with the job. Say that again. Say that again, and I'll take one of these balls and sink it in your goddamn mouth, Bigger said, his pride wounded to the quick. Ah, for Christ's sake, Jack said. You see how he is, Gus said. Why don't you say what you're going to do, Bigger demanded. Ah, I'm going to hell with you all. Gus said in a nervous tone that sought to hide itself, a tone that hurried on to other things. I'm going, but Bigger don't have to act like that. He don't have to cuss me. Why didn't you say that at first, Bigger asked. His anger amounted almost to frenzy. You make a man want to sock you. I'll help him on the hall, Gus continued, as though Bigger had not spoken. I'll help just like I always help, but I'll be goddamn, goddamn if I'm taking orders from you, Bigger. You just a scared coward. You call me scared so nobody will see how scared you is. Bigger leaped at him. But Jack ran between them. G.H. caught Gus's arm and led him aside. Who's asking you to take orders, Bigger said. I never want to give orders to a piss sop like you. You boys cut out that racket back there, Doc called. They stood silently about the pool table. Bigger's eyes followed Gus as Gus put his cue stick in the rack and brushed chalk dust from his trousers and walked a little distance away. Bigger's stomach burned and a hazy black cloud hovered a moment before his eyes and left. Mixed images of violence ran like sand through his mind, dry and fast, vanishing. He could stab Gus with his knife. He could slap him. He could kick him. He could rip him and send him sprawling on his face. He could do a lot of things to Gus for making him feel this way. Come on, G.H., Gus said. Where are we going? Let's walk. Okay. What are we going to do, Jack asked. Meet here at three? Sure, Bigger said. Didn't we just decide? I'll be here, Gus said with his back turned. When Gus and G.H. had gone, Bigger sat down and felt cold sweat on his skin. It was planned now when he would have to go through with it. His teeth gritted, and the last image he had seen of Gus going through the door lingered in his mind. He could have taken one of the cue sticks and gripped it hard and swung it at the back of Gus's head, feeling the impact of the hard wood cracking against the bottom of the skull. The tight feeling was still in him, and he, would, and he knew that it would remain until they were actually doing the job, until they were in the store taking the money. 
You and Gus sure don't get along, none, Jack said, shaking his head. Bigger turned and looked at Jack. He had forgotten that Jack was still there. Ah, that yellow black bastard, Bigger said. He's all right, Jack said. He's scared, Bigger said. To make him ready for a job, you have to make him scared two ways. You have to make him more scared of what'll happen to him if you don't do the job than of what'll happen to him if he pulls the job. If we go in and blums today, we oughtn't fuss like this, Jack said. We got a job on our hands, a real job. Sure, sure, I know, Bigger said. Bigger felt an urgent need to hide his growing and deepening feelings of hysteria. He had to get rid of it or else he would succumb to it. He longed for a stimulus powerful enough to focus his attention and drain off his energies. He wanted to run or listen to some swing music or laugh or joke or read a real detective story magazine or go to a movie or visit Bessie. All that morning, he had lurked behind his curtain of indifference and looked at things, snapping and glaring at whatever had tried to make him come out into the open. But now he was out, the thought of the job at Blum's and the tilt he had with Gus had snared him into things and his self-trust was gone. Confidence could only come now through action so violent that it would make him forget. These were the rhythms of his life, indifference and violence, periods of abstract brooding and periods of intense desire, moments of silence and moments of anger, like water ebbing and flowing from the tug of a faraway invisible force. Being this way was a need of his as deep as eating. He was like a strange plant blooming in the day and wilting at night, but the sun that made it bloom and the cold darkness that made it wilt were never seen. It was his own sun in darkness, a private and personal sun in darkness. He was bitterly proud of his swinging, of his swiftly changing moods and boasted that when he had to suffer the results of them. It was the way he was, he would say. He could not help it, he would say, and his head would wag. And it was his sullen stare and the violent action that followed that made Gus and Jack and G.H. hate and fear him as much as he hated and feared himself. Where you want to go, Jack asked. I'm tired of setting. Let's walk, Bigger said. They walked to the front door. Bigger paused and looked around the pool room with a wild and exasperated expression, his lips tightening with resolution. Go and Doc asked, not moving his head. Yeah, Bigger said. See you later, Jack said. They walked along the street in the morning sunshine. They waited leisurely at corners for cars to pass. It was not that they feared cars, but they had plenty of time. They reached South Parkway smoking freshly lit cigarettes. I'd like to see a movie, Bigger said. Trader Horn's running again at the Regal. They're bringing a lot of old pictures back. How much is it? 20 cents? Okay, let's see it.